What is infrastructure as code scanning or security scanning? Well, in this video, we're going to dive into that and find out. My name is Mackenzie Jackson, and you are listening to Tool Time by Aikido Security. The key concept behind infrastructure as code security scanning or IAC security scanning is pretty simple. We take our infrastructure as code files, like our YAML files or our HCL files. We scan them statically using different tools, for example, an open source one. And this will identify any misconfigurations we have in our code. There we are. Job done. But it's a little bit more involved than that. In this video, we're going to discuss where the strengths of IAC scanning are, where the weaknesses are, and where you could implement it in your software development lifecycle. So to first understand this, we, we have to have a little bit of a side quest into kind of going a little bit deeper into infrastructure as code. Infrastructure as code is fantastic, and it essentially allows us to codify how we build out our cloud infrastructure. So before infrastructure as code, we'd have to go into these dashboards and we'd be clicking around, creating a virtual machine over here, creating an S3 bucket over here, creating users, all of this manual process, and then put our application on top of that and let it run. And if we had any changes, we'd need to go through that process. It's very error prone. And not only that, if we had to do it multiple times, the chance of doing exactly everything correctly every single time is kind of almost null if you have dealt with these consoles. So infrastructure as code allowed us to codify our processes. It meant that we could version it in a kind of Git repositories. We can update it and we can control it and deploy it exactly the same every single time. It was really a breakthrough in so much of this DevOps and cloud infrastructure space. But it does also bring with it some security challenges. There's two main types of infrastructure as code. There's declarative and imperative. Now, declarative, my personal favorite, is basically when you declare your end state. So you're declaring, I want this S3 bucket. I want this EC2 instance. And you're declaring what you want. Imperative is the step-by-step -step process to be able to get there. So one kind of focuses on the end state, and there are tools in between that that figure that out and figure out the steps. And one is letting you control each individual step that you have. So Terraform or Plumi is declarative, and Ansible is imperative. Both of these are infrastructure as code. Both of these can be scanned by infrastructure as code tools if it's a good IAC scanning tool. So very quickly, this is take a little bit of a look at some examples. So here I have a Terraform example. And, and what am I doing? I'm saying here, I want a bucket with this name. It must be private and I should have versioning enabled. And when I run Terraform plan, then this is going to compare the desired state, what's in my file, to the state that exists in my kind of cloud infrastructure. And when I, I do Terraform apply, it then makes those changes for me. Now, in this case with Terraform, it will kind of reconcile, look at what you have and what you want, uh, only when you tell it to. If you use something like Kubernetes, it will actually reconcile that automatically, which is kind of cool. So with Kubernetes, I'm declaring that I want three replicas with this container running security uh, uh, restrictions. And Kubernetes controllers actually continuously check against this YAML file and if something crashes, like prod crashes, then Kubernetes will automatically kind of bring it back up. So it's saying, hey, there needs to be three containers and one's crashed, so I only have two, so I need to get another one back up. I, I know that that was a little bit of a side quest, but I think it's important because that's going to help us understand the actual big security implications of all of this, which aren't insignificant. So what are kind of the, some of the most common mistakes that we make when we're dealing with infrastructure as code? Publicly accessible data storage, that's probably the number one issue that we see. But open network ports or very wide CIDR uh, ranges are a big one. Overly permissive IAM roles or policies. Missing encryption. And the big one here is that often you'll have encryption in transit or at rest, but maybe not both. You could have privileged containers running at root. This is a big one because if an attacker finds a root container and can take over it, it's kind of game over. Unpinned container images could be a big one. There could be limits on your egress. And there's a whole lot more. One that I always like to bring up is missing or disabled logging and monitoring. And 
The reason why I like to bring this one up is because it's kind of not that intuitive is that it doesn't create a security incident by someone can attack you if you turn off logging, but it does limit all your visibility. So if an attack is happening, you're going to have no idea. And these actually are often turned off during testing or debugging or something along those areas, or if it's causing too much noise and cost on your cloud account. But this is actually a massive security issue. So is IIC scanning the only tool that you kind of need or should have to protect your cloud infrastructure? Absolutely not. The reason why IAC scanning is so important is that this is the earliest type of scanning that you can do in your security. So before you deploy an application or infrastructure with unprotected data storage, you can catch that. But it's not foolproof. And what I mean by that is it doesn't often catch complex relationships. If you've got very complex cloud infrastructure, you can also manually change things in your cloud account. So maybe someone goes in and manually changes a data storage or an IAM user role. If that's not in your infrastructure's code files, then you won't know about that risk. And also you could do IAC scanning on one developer's machine, but another developer might not have that in place. And if it's not centralized in a Git repository, then you know all of these can slip through the cracks. So let's have a look at some IAC scanning tools. Now, there's actually a bunch of different open source tools that you can use. And you can have a look at these tools and look at the stack that you're using. There's Chekhov, there's TerraScan, there's TriviConfig, and there's some other ones as well. I'm just gonna use TriviGear for this demonstration of the open source tool. And it's really quite simple. What I can do is I can just run a TriviScan so here it's kind of found a whole bunch of things. I have some public S3 buckets in, in here. I have some kind of overly persistent IAM user rights here. These ones allow for data exfiltration. Now we've looked at a couple of IAC scanning tools. I guess we need to know where in the development lifecycle do we actually put these in? Well, we've just shown you that you can scan it locally on your machine and you can do this with various tools. And, and this is great because it can prevent vulnerabilities from making it into production, but also into your Git repository, because the further along down the path we find them, the more difficult it is to actually be able to solve. So there's some great places you can actually implement IAC scanning. You can do it in your development environment. You can maybe implement it as a Git hook to run. But the one place that you absolutely have to have it is inside your version control system, inside your Git repository. Now, the reason is that just in case something is bypassed, we absolutely need the Git repository to be the central point of truth. And of course, you can do this uh, using something like a CI/CD pipeline, like GitHub Actions or Circle CI, or you can link up a tool so that it checks every time you make a commit. How we look at that is I'm going to open up here my dashboard of Aikido Security. Now, obviously, I work for Aikido Security, but this is all works in the exact same ways as I've showed you before. And so here we can filter on results and we can see all the different infrastructures called issues. We can see some of the ones that we've already talked about. Like here we have the public bucket issues. We have IAM user roles with over permissions. Here we have you know, observe. Uh, DevOps. So we have all of these different results and, and we can filter through. One of the really cool things about modern infrastructure as code tooling is that we can actually start implementing AI into this. So the most obvious way to implement AI is actually to implement something called auto fix. So if we have a look at auto fixing, what this does is it means that when we find an issue, we can actually generate code to fix it. So for example, here we have our public issue and that we've actually given us the code here to fix it and we can create a pull request and immediately fix that uh, as well. The other area that some commercial tools actually provide is the ability to ignore false positives. We have here an issue, which is that it automatically upgrades our base image of our Docker. This can be a big risk, but has ignored it because it's recognized that this is actually a test environment. So we don't need to worry about that in production. So it doesn't matter if you're using a commercial tool with all the bells and whistles, like I just showed you, or an open source tool uh, in your command line, both are going to be able to find similar types of vulnerabilities. And it's just going to depend on your use case and what additional features that you want. But just remember, make sure that you implement it inside your Git repository and you don't just scan it locally because that can cause issues to be missed. There are a few things that an infrastructure as code tool won't be able to find, and that's issues that are actually in your production, in your runtime, maybe things that have slipped through or have been manually created. And for that, we need CSPM, which guess what? Is the next video that we're looking forward to. So make sure you subscribe to the channel, like this video, and stay tuned to learn about cloud security posture management next.